Hello and welcome to Crossing Channels. I'm Rory Kathleen Jones. Can universal basic infrastructure support growth in different places? That's the subject of the latest in our podcast collaboration between Cambridge University's Bennett Institute for Public Policy and the Institute for Advanced Study in Toulouse. As ever, we're going to use the interdisciplinary strengths of both institutions to explore a complex challenge. Why is it so hard to iron out geographic differences in economic performance? Why are current policies failing to tackle regional inequalities? And how might a universal basic infrastructure boost productivity across all places? To explore these issues today, we have Diane Coyle from the Bennett Institute. Diane, start us off. What does your research focus on? Well, I'm an economist and a lot of my research is about productivity and one of the key aspects of productivity is why it differs so much in different places. So that's what we're talking about today. And in the interest of full disclosure, I should probably mention that Diane and I have been married for 33 years. Joining us from the IAST, we have Jean-Paul Azam. Uh, Jean-Paul, what are your main research interests? I'm an economist. Uh, I focus on political economy. I've spent a lot of time working on Africa, so there is a an anthropological dimension, but I, I work as well a lot on uh, other countries and uh, currently a bit on on France. We'll look forward to hearing from you on that, Jean-Paul. Uh, and joining us from the University of Manchester, we have Andy Westwood. Uh, Andy, remind us of your main research interests. I've got a background in public policy, so I'm particularly interested in how governments do all of these things. But like Diane, I'm particularly interested in productivity and how local and national government work together or don't work together. Well, we've got a lot to explore. So, Diane, why don't you start us off? Because you and Andy have written in a recent report calling for the implementation of a, quote, universal basic infrastructure, which we're going to call UBI. So what is UBI and what use might it be in particular in the UK? We um, have just released a report, Andy and I, with our colleague Stella Erka, calling for universal basic infrastructure as a means to start to tackle the very different fortunes of people living in different places around the UK. And obviously the name alludes to the very popular policy that some people have called for, universal basic income. But we're arguing for infrastructure being more important than income, because income... You know, obviously, we all need um, enough to buy the things that we need, the food, the housing, uh, the rent, the the leisure time and so on. But what's really important for people to get on, have the opportunities they need in life is that infrastructure, the investment in all the assets that create opportunities. And so that's partly things like transport networks, broadband networks, but also having a decent school and hospital system and um, also what are sometimes called soft infrastructure or places where people can come together that allow them to do the things that allow them to get on in life. And so it's about the sustainability and people's ability to um, shape their own futures. What we found in the report was huge variation across the UK in some of the key components of this, of this universal basic infrastructure. And did the lack of that universal basic infrastructure in some places actually read out as onto statistics about inequality and different economic performance. Were those places without the infrastructure definitely worse off? Well, a simple example of, of exactly that would be that if you don't have access to a bus stop and a good bus network, then you're not going to have much choice about where you can get to work. And so that immediately limits people's job opportunities. So there's definitely a link between access to these different things that people need to live decent and uh, productive lives. But it's also an issue for growing places as well, because somewhere that has created jobs and wants to bring in new housing, if the infrastructure isn't there, it's going to limit the capacity for that growth as well. So actually, it is linked to inequality across places. People have to have a minimum, but it's also linked to constraining growth in places that are doing much better. Andy, in your view, what makes UBI a more effective policy than other approaches we've seen in the past? We've already heard about universal basic income, universal credit and so on. But we've also had a whole range over the last 30, 40 years of different regional policies that have been tried and often failed. 
I think the key thing is, as Diane's just said, it's it's collective rather than individual. Looking at the needs of a particular kind of group of people in a particular place rather than their individual incomes or individual needs. And it seemed to us to be very hard to build these services out of an individual income approach rather than bringing them all together and thinking about what do particular places need in order to function in, a, in an optimal way. It's not meant to entirely replace those other things, like a, a good benefit system, paying a, a reasonable amount of benefits, as well as other in, individually focused systems and policies are still meant to kind of work alongside this. But uh, it's, that, it's that collective approach that matters most, I think. And without that, we just have very ineffective place-based policy, which, as you say, is something that certainly in the UK and particularly in England, we've been pretty bad at for the last 30 or 40 years, largely because we just keep chopping and changing arrangements for different policy approaches. And so another aspect of universal basic infrastructure, as we see it, is to adopt it for the long term and to, to use it as a way of organising and coordinating the delivery of particular services and activities. So that's a lot of change for a, a, an English system in particular that, that hasn't got used to doing any of those things or certainly hasn't got used to doing any of those things well. Jean-Paul, as we've heard, Diane and Andy are talking very much about the UK context and particularly the English context. Um, what are your thoughts on this proposal from a the viewpoint of uh, someone who looks at obviously the French economy, but also across Africa. Is it too radical, too ambitious? No, I think uh, it is a long-term uh, view, uh, Not, I hope not so long. But the key change or slight change in emphasis is very important to, to grasp because talking from a French point of view, the fact that the areas in France that are badly equipped with, with a basic infrastructure are usually easily characterized uh, or, or, say, stigmatized by some people as being people with Muslims or people with uh, very poor people. Or, and this triggers a lot of understated appeal for various kinds of segregation. So w once you emphasize this point and you take it seriously, it is a very important handle from, from a policy point of view to take governments to task. It's a kind of a measurement process whereby you can actually assess what governments have, have done in terms of levelling up between regions. Well, it's not just regions. We're in the same city like Toulouse, for example, there are areas which are completely treated as colonial places uh, with a very violent police and nothing is done really from a point of view of infrastructure, education and this kind of things. That's what I have in mind. Diane, let's talk about the you in this, the universal and why it's so important. Are you saying that what we need to do is, is set down minimum numbers of buses, minimum speed of broadband, a whole range of metrics, really, which every area will have to attain. In effect, yes, or at least give people the metrics for asking why their place is doing so much worse than some other places. I think Jean-Paul just raised a really important point. I, I'm an economist, as is he, and we are talking about economic growth prospects and what kind of jobs can people get to. But actually, there is a democratic aspect to this as well and why should people living in certain places not be able to expect as good a set of infrastructure and services as those living in, in more affluent places if for example we are expecting people to apply for passports online or even in future vote online access government services online then surely it's absolutely reasonable to say there must be minimum broadband speeds Everywhere, everybody as a citizen has the right to access those. And we have in UK political discussions this allergy to what, what's called the postcode lottery. Oh, we can't do such and such policy because it will create a postcode lottery. Well, what we found in this report is that, my goodness, we have a postcode lottery already because there's so much variation between people's access to some basic services depending on, on where they live. The short answer is, is yes, it is a minimum. 
And we haven't in the report set out, well, you know, this it, it should be this broadband download speed and this broadband upload speed. But thinking about what is what is the right level of aspiration for everybody in your country to have as residents and citizens, I think is a really reasonable question to ask in the context of the great geographic inequalities that we've seen emerging. Andy, can't this actually prove vastly expensive and inefficient in some ways? We had in this country a few years ago, I think it was Boris Johnson promising gigabit broadband for everybody, literally 100%. And when I questioned officials, it was, yes, everybody, until people began to realise that laying fibre optic cables up mountains to every remote farm was a bit daft. Doesn't this invite that kind of economic fantasy land stuff? I think one of the hardest things to get right in in the kind of infrastructure we're talking about is that provision of something like broadband in the most rural of areas. So the key thing here, I think, is what's what's the right basic level of, of delivery that you can achieve, bearing in mind that, uh, as Diane said, this is the, the medium through which other services can be accessed and there's a there's a cost that can be absorbed towards this by doing that. But also, there's just the realisation that you don't have to do all of this yourself. If you're a government, you can require a basic minimum of service, including to difficult rural areas. But um, the principle still still should apply. If you're a, a taxpayer, a member of society, you need to be able to access services and and, um, via broadband will be one of the most cost efficient ways to do it. And I think to follow up on the discussion so far, the point of this is both economic and political. So it's economic in that you want people to be able to have a platform for taking part in the economy and maximising their input to the economy. But there's also a a solidarity issue politically. And if you leave people out or you leave places out, whether they're rural or, or, or parts of towns or parts of cities then you create all sorts of political tensions and problems for for, for yourself as a nation um, because you're undermining that solidarity. Once you take that broader view of both public service delivery, the economy and and the political context, the cost of, of reaching every area with a minimum level of something like broadband, I think, is is less prohibitive. Diane, do rural areas actually need the same level of infrastructure as towns? People choose to live in the country often for rather different reasons and maybe we're going to be gold plating the countryside. Well that's why we're talking about a basic level so we're not saying everywhere has to be the same it's not going to be super duper fast everywhere but everywhere has to have a basic level because otherwise to pick up on Andy's point that is exactly the government writing off certain communities and you don't really have a functioning nation if, if that's what you're doing. Jean-Paul, I know your research has has mainly focused on the macroeconomics of Africa. Is this a realistic and and promising movement, as it were, for promoting growth in Africa? Well, uh, yes, and it's currently working to some extent due to various interventions in different countries, including by private companies. But a lot of uh, business and trade is done through uh, smart telephone, and it works. We have evidence that for finding the right price uh, for a good, in which city is it the highest for the seller or the cheapest for the buyers and all that, it is working. Quite a lot of uh, research has been performed on that. And uh, the outcome is amazing in terms of uh, increasing the the business that the, these people are engaged in. It's a you know very simple thing, but it works. I've been hearing for I think at least the last fifteen years that mobile phones are going to be the technology that leapfrogs African economies ahead. And to be honest, although there are sort of pockets where that's happening, it doesn't seem to me that there's great evidence that that is true so far. Am I wrong? The evidence is scattered. Uh, I agree with you. I uh, I haven't found a synthesis uh, about all that, but I've heard many seminar presentations with very convincing evidence about that. One thing which is very important is that sometimes they simply don't need it because they have other mechanisms for transferring information. And uh, in some regions, people are are traveling a lot, especially traders. They make money like that. So it, it depends. 
on uh, what type of growth you're, you're, you're looking at. If you restrict your focus on modern industrial growth, you're not going to get much of that in Africa, even with, uh, with, with a lot of uh, infrastructure, although what is sometimes needed is uh, institutional infrastructure, justice departments and these type of things that don't work. But uh, it's the same in France currently. So uh, you can grow differently in different places, handling different tools. Globally, I think uh, the, the telephone has been uh, amazingly useful for especially uh, the countryside or the, the most remote areas of the big cities. So, uh, well, no, I'm, I'm more optimistic than you are. Uh, Diane, you focus a lot on productivity, looking at the nature of productivity growth. It's your theory, isn't it, that universal basic infrastructure can not just sort of level places up, pull forward the left behind, but boost economic growth everywhere. Yes, so it's it's quite interesting listening to Jean-Paul. There's been a lot of discussion in the economic research into low-income countries about the role played by infrastructure, and bodies like the World Bank have long been helping that investment. The investment's still quite patchy, but I agree with Jean-Paul that, on balance, it's quite positive. You know, not all infrastructure delivers what's hoped for, but on balance, there's a clear link between investing in infrastructure and economic growth. So in a way, what Andy and Stella and I did was try to bring that discussion to the, the home context in the UK and talk about prospects for poorer places here. But it also matters for very dynamic places being able to grow as well. One of the features of the debate is not being able to build new laboratories or build new housing in growing places because um, people are object to the congestion that will cause on the roads or the strain it will put on the electricity and water networks. So the lack of investment in infrastructure actually constrains success as well as holding back the places that have already been left behind. So it isn't just a question of levelling up, it's a, it's a question of if we want a successful economy at all, we've got to invest in the basics that allow businesses to do their own investment and expand and people to get the kind of jobs that they want, they want to do. It's just the sort of, in a metaphorical sense as well as a literal sense, the wiring of the economy. And if you don't wire the economy, it's not going to grow. And you, just to come back to your report, your report found that even in places like Cambridge, where you are, there were sort of some deficiencies in basic infrastructure. Yes, the basic utilities, electricity and water under great strain already and any hopes for getting people to accept large new housing developments, as Michael Gove, the minister, has said he wants, will depend on them being persuaded that the amenities they already have are not going to suffer through many more people coming in and using them. Andy, your report compares the UK unfavourably to Germany and France. Lots of statistics saying gosh, UK well, well behind East Germany even. But aren't regional inequalities as big or sometimes bigger in those countries than they are in the UK? I mean, we know in, in France, for instance, that there's historically been a very centralised place and a huge amount of infrastructure in Paris, but perhaps not in more remote rural areas. No, so so there are obviously differences between places in both France and Germany, but the levels of inequality are much deeper within the UK than both of those countries. And as, as our report shows, and this is research that uh, Stella Erker led and it, it has some fantastic data in, in the report, particularly looking at Germany, and it shows that the level of infrastructure is much more consistent across very different parts of Germany than it is in England. That's a, quite a surprise, I think, for, for lots of people, but it's a, it's a real problem from both perspectives in England. And and that, of course, given that we looked quite heavily at places in the former East Germany, that's despite the challenges of reunification and the, the big, big gaps that existed in the in the 80s and 90s in Germany. So I think it's a real surprise that those inequalities are so much greater within the UK and in, and in England in particular than they are in, uh, in both Germany and France. Jean-Paul, let's get your perspective on France here. I mean, would it surprise you to hear these two... British economists saying, oh, we're so much worse than France. You, you seem to be quite pessimistic about regional inequality in France. Well, the good news is that they have uh, 
wanted to put the optic fiber from my place a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> uh, so it's improving. But to take things more seriously, the problem in France is a lot about institutions, which are uh, segregationist in many ways, and the resulting violence that from time to time destroys quite a bit of the infrastructure. When people are fed up in one area, they destroy everything and there is a kind of uh, blackout in terms of information and uh, schools and bus stops and many other things. The key point is that there is a deep sense that if you favor some areas, if you try to help some areas to catch up, then you sort of change the balance of power between the police and, the, say, the migrants or whatever. And that's why there is a lot of reluctance to invest. What you seem to be saying is that you know we shouldn't just think about economic growth in terms of the promise of UBI. It's got a, a chance of breaking that vicious cycle whereby people sort of destroy their local infrastructure in frustration of what's going on, uh, can prevent violence. Remember Adam Smith, who was saying uh, peace easy taxes and a reasonable administration of justice are what is requisite for the highest level of prosperity. What is missing in France is basically peace. And the main reason why it is missing is that the administration of justice is not reasonable. So that you have uprisings from time to time in some parts of the city, there will be an outbreak of violence and then the police will become even more violent and all that. So growth is fine if you have peace and uh, infrastructures play a key part in providing the requisite, as uh, Adam Smith would say, for, for peace to prevail. And I have one example, if you allow me, it's very short. What happened in Sudan? The Americans were preventing the pipeline to be built. But the Chinese took over, built the pipeline. A couple of months later, the rebels blew up the pipeline, which is very cheap by the, the standards of the oil industry. And then the government realized that they could not get the oil money unless they included the rebels in the government. And the peace process started immediately. Because even the, the, the worst military officer had understood that if they want the oil money, they need to establish peace with the, the rebels. And as soon as this is done, the pipeline will bring an enormous amount of money to, to everybody. You can't have growth without peace. You can't have peace without infrastructure, a decent level of infrastructure. And you can't have the decent level of uh, infrastructure unless you have some political setting that is exactly adjusted to, to the situation of the, the, those people. We all seem agreed on the desirability of this idea, that this is an idea whose time has come. But Dan and Andy, I, I, I want you to sort of finish by working out what challenges there will be in implementing it. Uh, Dan, is this going to be an easy win? Is it, is it already being accepted or are there, there's, is there going to be large resistance to it? Well, it does imply spending money in different ways. So that's never politically easy. But we are going to have an election in the UK. So it might be easier if there's a government after the election with a large majority to demonstrate its commitment to the kind of places that have been experiencing decline, decaying services for such a long time. So in that sense, it might be an idea whose time has come. I think Jean-Paul's example was great at emphasising the collective aspect of this. So if you're talking about assets that everybody in the community can see are of, of mutual benefit, then that, that does help with the, you know, addressing the kind of political polarisation and, and disagreements that we've been experiencing, you know, and as your question implied, not just in the UK, but in lots of other countries too. So maybe... Um, having written this about the UK, we can take Universal Basic Infrastructure International and recommend it for other places. Infrastructure needs investment. Investment is, is money that's got to be found from somewhere. Some of that will be government, some of that will have to be private sector. Andy, let's just drill down into that. This is going to be an idea that all political parties may actually welcome, and then they will say, yeah, but we can't afford it, won't they? Well, they might, they might. But I think if you understand the value of what we're trying to achieve here, I think it's worth them pausing before they do that. 
as Jean Paul says, you know, his his conception of peace is terrific. I think here because one of the things we think basic infrastructure can help do is rebuild democracy where it's in crisis in different parts of uh, of the country and and arguably in the country as a whole. But it's also about rebuilding bits of the economy that uh, uh, have suffered in huge ways over the past kind of 20 or 30 years and leave places and people ill-equipped to contribute and to earn a decent standard of living. So it's about rebuilding more than just the particular challenges that particular places face. The approach isn't just about what government has to spend. It's about, as Diane says, it's about regulation. It's about getting the private sector to pay its fair share. And a lot of the services we look at are delivered and and owned by the private sector. So really, I think the hardest thing for governments, certainly in in the UK, to do with this isn't, isn't really about the investment. It's about the coordination working together between different departments and different agencies but it's also about working together between central and local government and getting that coordination right and understanding what it takes including across things like regulation and procurement and and all these sorts of things is perhaps the bigger institutional challenge and part of that will require creating and sustaining an effective local government which um hasn't been the case for 20, 30, 40 years. We've had a fairly weakly uh, constituted and funded layer of local government. And what we see is uh, uh, the real importance of local government in leading some of these services, as well as the assessment of different elements of infrastructure that different places need. Perhaps the biggest challenge isn't how you finance this. The biggest challenge is how you actually coordinate government and deliver it. And it would be interesting to hear how different political parties kind of consider that challenge. Jean-Paul, I'm going to give you the last word to give us a sort of broader perspective outside uh, the UK uh, and and whether this is an idea whose time has come, both from the economic community and and from the politicians, and whether you you see it gathering force and and actually being implemented. There was a time when the the Bretton Woods system was was bent on building infrastructure and then it ran out of fashion. The key point to emphasize is, as has been emphasized by by all of us now, you have to have a broad perspective. Don't, Don't invest in things that will increase inequalities between groups and try to make sure that the infrastructure will force the government to have an inclusive politics and infrastructure. I mean, don't worry, the World Bank, the EU and all that have the money to help finance a lot of those investments if if that raises issue. I think this report is helping a lot to clarify the concepts. And I, I think this is what is really the most important thing to emphasize. Jean-Paul, thank you. That's all we have time for on this episode. Thanks to Diane Coyle from the Bennett Institute, Jean-Paul Azam from the Institute for Advanced Study in Toulouse, and Andy Westwood from the University of Manchester. Let us know what you think of this latest episode of Season 3 of Crossing Channels. You can contact us via Twitter, as I still insist on calling it. The Bennett Institute is at Bennett Inst. The Institute for Advanced Study in Toulouse is IAS Toulouse, and I am Ruskin 147. If you enjoyed this episode, then do listen to our other Crossing Channels editions, notably our latest one on the value of health tech. It's a cracker. And please join us next month for the next edition, where we'll be looking at economic growth and climate change.